Okay, we're on uh, part three of fight or flight. If you watch one and two, you realize, start my little timer there, you realize when we were talking about all the things that happen when fight or flight starts, you're in that thing, blood blushes, muscle gets tense, you get that big adrenaline pump, you now have all this super strength that you never had before because you've got all this blood and all these large muscle groups, your heart rate's up, pupils are dilated, you got tunnel vision, you got auditory exclusion. Now what happens after the critical incident? This is where you, you can kind of recover quicker or you can prevent maybe some PTSD. This is, th th there's a lot of different philosophies out there, okay? And I'm telling you from my experience what I've kind of learned from actually seeing it happen, from having it happen to me, and from what I've read and studied. Now, everybody's going to have a different opinion. There may be somebody on here that will say, oh, man, this guy's got it all wrong. He don't know what he's talking about. Well, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> they don't have to come here. It's free country. So um, when you're coming down, first of all, you're going to probably feel a little weak. You've just had a huge adrenaline pump. When somebody takes drugs, and I go back to my drug thing because it, it helps relate to this. If I take a shot of uh, uh, crack, okay, and I smoke a crack pipe and I get a hit, I get the same thing as a fight or flight. Heart rate jumps up. I get this euphoric feeling, kind of pain, desensitization. It takes away my pain receptors. It shuts down blood vessels. It does all that. Well, then after I get that hit, I get this crash. And when the crash comes, depending on how strong the drug, what my tolerance is, etc. Somebody that goes through fight or flight a lot will have a quicker recovery or a less um, accelerated fight or flight response. If I shoot somebody every day, on about the 10th day, my heart rate, instead of going to 200, it's going to go maybe to 150. And after about 20 days, it may only go up to 100. And if I do it every day, pretty soon I can pretty much go out and kill somebody and probably stay at a resting heartbeat because it becomes routine and I've been desensitized. Now, do you want to get desensitized? I don't think you do. Obviously, you don't want to go kill everybody every day, but your fight or flight response, the more you activate it, the less effective it becomes. So, people in wars, people who are always in this hyper alert state, this looking around corners and clearing buildings and not trusting anybody, not, kind of like cops, but not quite as severe as when you're in war. After being in that situation the whole time, your body becomes somewhat numb. And it kind of starts, you can't take that adrenaline pump all the time, or when you get it, it doesn't matter. Just like developing tolerance for crack. First time you do it, great buzz, fantastic, everybody raves about it. The more you do it, the more you need. You need to increase your dosage to get the same effect. Fight or flight the same way. So. If you've never experienced it, when you experience it, it's going to be, wow, what the hell was that, man? My body was crazy. <laughs> well, but if you experience all the time, it becomes less and less and you recover quicker. Same way if you're in shape. When your lungs, we talked about breathing on gun is one of the fundamentals about breathing if you're breathing real heavy. When your heart rate jumps up to 200, guess what? It's pumping more blood. If it's pumping more blood, it needs more oxygen. So your breathing's going to go up. You want more oxygen because you need more oxygen to get more blood to keep the blood going to your large blood vessels or your large muscle groups. So all these things are uncontrollable. So you're like, <sighs> you're breathing. All these things are happening. And then after it's all over, you get this sudden just almost like a meltdown. Kind of like if a parent's ever experienced their kid getting hurt. They rush to the ER. They just can't think anything. And, and then when, when they find out their kid's okay, it's like, there's this crash. They may cry. They may have this emotional release. They, they get this just overwhelming of just, I'm just wasted. Well, you still have this adrenaline in you, and if you didn't use it in a fight or flight, if you didn't have to run, if you didn't have to get a physical fight, if you didn't have to use that adrenaline pump, it's still in your body. And what happens to it? It has to be released. That's when you get your tremors. That's when your hand will start shaking uncontrollably. You'll sit down and you're like, 
can't stop my hands, my leg, man. I don't know what's going on, man. I remember sitting in the car, I don't know how many times, man, my legs is going up and down. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> you're trying to hold it. You're trying not to be a wimp. You're like, man, I don't want to see somebody see me shaking. They'll think I'm scared. It's a normal reaction. It's just something that your body has to get rid of this adrenaline. Your body says, I have all this energy that I gave you to survive. You didn't use it. I got to get rid of it. Well, how do you get rid of that adrenaline? You have to use it. It's good to go for a walk. There's a couple times on a couple incidents when I got done, I go, I need to go for a run. <laughs> I strap my gun on and just take off down the road in this neighborhood, run about a couple, three blocks, come back. <sighs> I got rid of some of that energy. I got rid of some of that adrenaline. I came back. I was able to think. It calmed me down. I was able to decompress from the high risk situation. Well, you know, I mean, you got to do what you got to do. You can sit down and try to go... I'm going to ego through this and just do it. You can do that and your body will eventually burn off. Your heart rate will stay high. You're going to be processing a lot more blood. You're not as processing as fast as if you're using it, but you're still processing all that energy. It has to work its way out. So, Rick, what the hell does this have to do with shooting? This, this process will save your life and you need to embrace it instead of being afraid of it. And again, knowledge is power. Understanding that fight or flight is normal. Understanding that if you have somebody caught, do you want to fight this person or do you want to give them an escape? I've had some big crazy guys where I'm outnumbered or I know if I get in a fight with this dude, I don't stand a chance because he's 350, 400 pounds. He'll jump. Man, if he gets a hold of me, he's going to jump on me and smash me. So I didn't want to have to fight him. And if he forced the issue, I always gave him an escape. I would back up and give them a chance. I, I've even told people, dude, man, you don't want to fight me. I'll shoot your ass. But if you want to run, you can take off and we'll just catch you tired. And, man, a lot of them would just run. I'd be like, you know, that's all right. I'd rather him run. It gives me time to release some of my energy while I'm chasing him. I can call it in on a radio. I can get more units there. I can get fresh cops there that aren't in this adrenaline pump so much. They haven't used anything. They haven't been chasing this guy. They get out of the car and they can take him down. It's safer. It's less chance of him taking my gun. It's less chance. Some people may go, oh, man, he's a wimp. Look, I'm not into losing. Okay, if I get in a fight, I'm going to win. And I'll do what it takes to win. But I understand that if I back a dude in a corner and it's going to be fight or flight, I don't want to fight every guy I have to deal with. Especially as a cop, you just don't, you get tired of it. There's a lot more paperwork than if you hurt him, than if you get your gun, then you end up shooting him. I mean, ask George Zimmerman. That's been in the paper for a while. Ask him if he wished he didn't have to fight that dude. He didn't have a choice. It came out later that Martin came up and hit him in the face. It wasn't his fault. He had to defend himself, and he started losing, and he had to resort to his gun. George Zimmerman, I guarantee you, was in fight or flight. When you heard him screaming on that radio or on 911 for help, he was in fight or flight. He thought he was going to die. His heart rate went to 200, 220 beats per minute. He had auditory exclusion. He probably couldn't hear. He probably couldn't see anything but Trayvon punching him in the face. His head was banged up. He was probably losing consciousness. His body was about to black out, and at some point he made the decision, if I don't kill this guy, I'm going to be dead. Now, of course, the media is not going to tell you that, and of course not going to tell you that, but I've been enough of these incidents. Taking a life is a big choice, and if you're not mentally prepared to do that, which takes me back to part one where the woman, called, a woman wrote me an email or a comment about, we don't have guns, and just seeing you handle guns makes me nervous. You shouldn't be nervous around a gun. Guns, to me, I feel comfortable around. I got all these guns here. I feel comfortable. They're, they're, they're a sweet sensation to me. I've been around them my whole life. I know these things can save your life. I know it's a piece of equipment that's invaluable in a crisis. But, and, it, and it's the best equalizer in the world for a woman. That's what I think gun control is the most sexist thing out there. When you take away a woman's right to, to equal ground, to take away the strength and, the, and, and, and the, a guy's position, stronger or bully to be able to take a woman, and, I, and you know, I'm going to have some feminists come over here, well, I know women that can beat up men, whatever. In most situations, a man can take advantage of a woman if he wants to. He has physical strength, size, etc. When you take away a woman's right, to own a gun, to defend herself, and to make the ground equal, because I'm telling you the best equalizer in the world is right here. The best equalizer in the world is a gun. For an oppressive government, 
for a tyrannical government, for tyranny, you name it, a gun is the best equalizer. Why do you think governments always try to take them? Because governments don't like citizens that are equal. They like to run and control them. I'm getting off on a, on a government thing, but I'm telling you, guns, Second Amendment was put in there by the Founding Fathers because they knew that a citizen that isn't armed is a victim looking for a place to happen. And I'm telling you, if you're a woman, if you live alone, if you go and dark, if you're a, a guy who is wimpy, who's never been in a fight, if you're a guy who's a macho, steroid-taking, muscle-bound, this gun is an equalizer to someone else with a gun. Because if they have a gun, you don't bring a fist or a knife to a gunfight. If you're in a gunfight, you bring a gun, and you don't get to choose. The bad guy or the government gets to choose when they come after you with a gun. So I am so pro-gun, and I'm just telling you, don't be scared of these guns. This is a piece of equipment. You can clean it. You can get it. Yeah, they got them in paint. They got them in all these nice colors. You can whatever it takes to make this gun. If you want to put flowers on here, if you want to write peace and have it engraved, if you want to put love <laughs> on one side, and that makes you feel good, paint little flowers. Ah, oh, you want to sleep with under your pillow? That's great. This gun is going to save your life. It's the best equalizer out there. Don't be brainwashed. Don't be confused that this gun is bad, this gun is evil, this is an assault gun, we're going to use all these mean weapons, this is a weapon of destruction, ooh, it's got, oh, it's got bullets, they can kill, ooh, don't buy into all that crap, people, this, I'm trying to educate you to where you feel comfortable with a gun, you need to go out, be able to buy a gun, pick up a gun, handle a gun, have the confidence to say, you know what? This is a mechanical piece of equipment. I know this slide works right here. I know this is a slide stop. I know if I keep my finger off the trigger of this gun. I know if I clear this gun and it's not loaded, this gun can't hurt anybody unless I hit him in the head with it. And that's okay too. You may have to do that. But this gun is a weapon if it's used as a weapon. Otherwise, it's a self-defense device that's going to save your life. It's the great equalizer. This thing, I mean, if you want to carry around a bow and arrow, you, you can do that. If you want to carry around a knife, if you want to carry around a fake gun and try to fake somebody out, you can do that. If you want to carry around a hot cup of coffee and say, this is my defense, this is a salt coffee because it's hot. I got it at McDonald's when they got sued because it was too hot. So if I throw it in your face and burn you, it's an assault coffee. So the government will be out long coffee soon. As soon as people start figuring out, they can use hot coffee to rob places. And it's been done. There's been plenty of people robbing things with hot, something hot, or they'll come in with acid, or they'll come in and, and with white powder and say it's it's sarin gas, or it's, it's uh, you know, some sort of poison. If you don't give me the money, I'll throw it on you. And, you know, you can use anything for a weapon, whether it's a bag of sugar, a feather. If you, if I say this feather's been dipped in uh, nerve gas, and if I stab you, you're going to die, you better give me the money or I'm going to poke you with this feather. Well, are we going to outlaw feathers now? Don't get, don't buy into that, people. Guns are a piece of equipment. It'll save your life. And for somebody in a situation, especially, not only is it women, that's a great equalizer for men. If somebody is handicapped, it's a great equalizer. In Texas, they have a concealed carry uh, to where you have a right to carry. They have classes for people in wheelchairs so they can carry a gun. Now, there was a, we had a cop that, that got hit by a drunk driver and his arm was all messed up. And he, he worked, and he actually worked for my agency. And when we take him to the range, I didn't think he probably should be carrying a gun because when he held a gun, it was easy for somebody to take. But he, he was still doing the job. They still hired him. And, you know, he didn't go in on a high, on a front end. He came in after places were secure and everything, but he was a cop and he had a gun. But he, it caused him problems because he had a weak grip. He didn't have the strength because of his accident to hold his gun. So a lot of times his gun would jam. And we'll talk about jams later. I'm at uh, 15 minutes here. So uh, we'll end that there on fight or flight three. Kind of went off in a lot of areas. Don't be scared of a gun, people. And don't be scared of fight or flight. It's going to save your life. It's designed automatically. You don't have to think about it. But knowledge is power. Understanding it, knowing it, it's going to help you. We'll end that there. Hope that helps, buddy. Miss G, you're good boys.